We are back, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of uh, Cage My IQ. This is the PFL week number four, four card breakdown sponsored by High Tide Herbal. PFL hasn't been uh, broadcasting for the past month. They did the first three shows. I took a month off. They're going to do the next three shows now. In Atlanta, Georgia, before they take another month off, and then they're going to start the playoffs. But this week we are doing PFL Week Four, where we had where it's headlined by Clay Cotter going up against Alex Martinez. This week we got the lightweights and the light heavyweights, so it's going to be a fun uh, nine fights on on the bout for this week. But before we get into that, I just want to guys give a shout out to our sponsor once again, High Tide Herbal. If you guys don't know who High Tide Herbal is, check out the video right now. Offering high quality, sustainable products with all natural lab tested ingredients, it's High Tide Herbal's mission to help others live the longest, healthiest, and most productive lives possible. Their hemp derived CBD products have a wide variety of uses from helping sore muscles to skin hydration and minimizing skin irritation. They generate results based on your specific needs. Elevate your lifestyle with the new wave of wellness. Visit HighTideHerbal.com to learn more. Once again, that's High Tide Herbal. We're running a promo with them. All you got to do is go to www.HighTideHerbal.com. Put in the promo code down below, CageMyIQ10 at checkout to receive 10% off your next purchase. As you guys know, this is Cage My IQ, and we are on social media. So if you guys haven't done so already, follow and subscribe to us on Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, and YouTube. As you see now, uh, this is always broadcast on YouTube. So if you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button down below on this video and the notification bell. So any of the content that we put out, you guys get it right away. And then, of course, smash the like button down below. That is very important. Uh, we want to get all the, the likes up. We want to get everybody watching our content. So if you can smash the like button and also hit us up in the comment section. I want to get everybody's opinion on this week's uh, fight card for PFL. I want you guys' opinions on who's going to win, who's a sleeper, who you guys think is being over talked about too much and who's being overlooked. Give me your opinions in the comment section and I'll look at all of them and I'll see if I can respond back to everybody's comments uh, on this video. And then of course I just started it. I opened up a cash app. So uh, as you see down below, uh, we're on cash app now. So if you guys want to uh, donate uh, to the podcast, help us out. Uh, we're on Cash App, as you see right there, Money Sign, Daniel Bakley. If you wish to support the show, we're on there. Uh, we appreciate all the love and all the help that we can get. Uh, we, we put a lot of work into uh, putting the content out. So if you guys want to support the show, uh, the Cash App is right there. We'd really appreciate it. But other than that, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this uh, breakdown. We got a nine-fight uh, card for week four uh, taking place on on, uh, on that Friday, June 17th, 2022. It's going to be on ESPN+. Plus. Uh, of course, all you got to do is to subscribe to ESPN+. Plus, and then you can catch all the action uh, with PFL. It's going to take place in Atlanta, Georgia. But we're going to start with the first fight on, on heavyweight matchup between Martin Hamlet going up against Josh Cervera. Uh, Josh Cervera wasn't able to fight on the first card. And so he's come back onto uh, week four to fight uh, one of the top guys uh, from last year, Martin Hamlet. As you see right there, we've got Martin Hamlet and Josh Cervera. As you see right there, nine and three for uh, Martin Hamlet coming out of Norway. And then you got Josh Cervera, who is 8-0, undefeated, and he's fighting out of Coconut Creek, Florida. In uh, his last time out, Martin Hamlet was able to win a decision victory over Theodorus Oxer to lose 
uh, by decision. So he was able to pull out three points in week one. And then in uh, Josh's first fight uh, in the PFL, he was able to beat Muhammad Juma by a rear naked choke submission on the contender series uh three months ago this is gonna be a very interesting fight because you got both guys who have a uh, wrestling backgrounds uh, as you see right there josh has a pure wrestling background but then he has a really good striking to go with it a lot of his striking is very strong in the beginning he tries to get the fight to the ground multiple times he uses brute power but over time one of his weaknesses is he starts to uh, get tired and his cardio runs out. So he relies a little too much on the wrestling as the fight goes on. Whereas Martin Hamlet, he has that Greco Roman background. He has the submission game, but he has good hands too. And, but lately he's been fighting to decision where he just outdoes his opponents and uh, catches them uh, in a uh, uh, low volume uh, fights where he pulls out the victory due to his grappling along the cage. I'm going the big upset here. I'm going with Josh Cervera. I'm going with him by a round two rear naked choke here. I feel like he's going to come in here motivated that he missed the first fight on week one. He's going to come in here. He's going to take down Hamlet several times. I think Hamlet will have the, the, the success on the feet. So Josh is going to look to take the fight down as much as possible. I think he wears out Hamlet and he gets him – by round two submission uh, with the rear naked choke. This was kind of hard for me to decide, but I feel like Josh can come in here and make some noise and get that uh, victory under his belt. So I'm going with Josh Silvera by round two rear naked choke. Moving on to the next fight on the card, we have another light heavyweight matchup between uh, newcomers Rob Wilkinson versus Victor Pesta. Uh, these are two two guys that are coming in. Uh, we got Razor, Rob Wilkinson versus Victor Pesta. They're fighting out of Australia and the Czech Republic. So we have a nice international matchup here. In his first fight, uh, uh, Wilkinson uh, KO'd Bruce Soto in, in the second round, as you see there, by knees and punches. And then you got uh, Victor who lost to... Uh, Omari Akhmadov by KO overhand right in round one in week one. This is going to be an interesting matchup here because you got Rob Wilkinson who he likes to uh, grapple and strike. A lot of his fights end in, in finishes. And as you saw there against a guy, a well-powered guy in Bruce Suto, he was able to get the finish there. And uh, so he, he's looking to get the finish. He's not looking to go to decision in majority of his fights. Whereas Victor Pesta, who <coughs> has a grappling submission uh, background, he likes to get the fight to the ground. He's very good <coughs> in close con uh, combat. That's what he has a lot of his uh, training in is close combat fighting. He looks to get the fight down and the majority of his fights are won by submission. But then, of course, his couple losses that he has are by knockout. So he does have that chin that ha has been uh, knocked in and tested. And if he gets hit, he tends to go out. That's why I'm going with Rob Wilkinson here by first-round knockout here. He can bring the heat. Uh, Victor, as long as the fight stays standing, he can bring the heat and not knock Pesta out. The one factor here is if Victor Pesta can get the fight to the ground where he's more comfortable, he'd be very good at, at getting a, a win by submission or being one of those shocking victories for the week. I just don't think it's going to happen. I think they're going to fear each other out in the first round, and Wilkinson's going to catch him with the overhand shot and then put him down. So I got Rob Wilkinson uh, continuing his uh, good streak with the first round knockout of Victor Pesta. So I got Rob Wilkinson in this matchup. Moving on to the next fight, we got a late heavyweight matchup between Emiliano Sordi going up against Daylon Monte. Everybody knows Emiliano Sordi. He's a former champ. And then you got newcomer Daylon Monte <coughs> fighting out Argentina. 
and Brazil, as you see right there, he lost the split decision. Uh, uh, he, <coughs> he, he lost his last fight um, it, it, by ground and pound to uh, Corey Hendricks. The fight I was talking about before was the loss to Antonio Carlos Jr. by decision in the playoffs last year where it was a split decision. But uh, you got Corey Hendricks who knocked him out uh, by ground and pound in their fight. Uh, he's been a guy that just hasn't looked the same. It must be the age. It must be just the competition catching up to him. But he was very good uh, with his uh, knockouts and his submissions. He's very good at distance. He likes to throw leg kicks. But lately he's been having to go – Win these low volume fights where he throws the leg kicks, he throws the punches, he dictates the center of the octagon, and he has to dictate the fight to uh, have any chance to win. And he's going up against a guy with high level jiu jitsu and striking with uh, Daniel Monte, who lost in the first minute to Antonio Carlos Jr. by dar stroke. But then before that, he got that submission on bar. Eight months ago, to uh, now, Alicia Philo by submission. This guy comes in. He he has a wrestling background. He takes you down, and he and like I said, he has a high level jiu jitsu background. He likes to go, take the back of his opponents, or he likes to take a front. If he takes a front guard, he just does a a very good ground and pound. If he gets the back of you, he takes his time, picks his shots, and then he looks to submit you. He has a nice uh, fluctuation of ground and pound and uh, submission victories to his name. I thought getting Antonio Carlos Jr. in the first fight was just a recipe for disaster for a newcomer. But he gets a guy who has a lot of uh, uh, like success in sortie, but who's been on the downside of things here. I either see Sorty winning by decision, or I think Dana Monte wins by ground and pound. <coughs> and what I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Dana Monte by round three, ground and pound. Yes, round three. I think these guys go at it. I think Sorty uh, like chooses the pace early. He goes in there. He picks and chooses with his leg shots. The fighting from kickboxing range. And then he throws back and forth. But as the fight goes on, he's going to get tired. And I think that's when Monte takes over with the grappling. He wears him out with the wrestling, gets him down several times, applies pressure to him. And eventually in round three, I think he gets the the rear naked ch uh, uh, choke submission or a ground and pound. But I'm going to lean towards the ground and pound here because I feel like the strength of Dan and Monte is going to do in sortie. So I'm going round three, grind and pound victory for Dana Monte and puts him on the board with four points in the PFL standings. Moving on to the next fight <coughs> in PFL four, we got the first lightweight matchup of uh, week four. It's, it's a rematch of last year. We got Natan Schultz going up against Marcin Held. We got Russo Schultz, and then we got Held. And these guys are coming in from Brazil and Poland. And uh, Natan's last fight, he lost uh, by decision to Olivier Uban Mercier by split decision in a very fun back and forth fight. And then in Marcin Held's last fight, which was over a year ago, he also lost to Olivier. Uban uh, Mercier by decision. But when these guys fought before, uh, it went to a decision, and Marcin Held won it there. And Natan Short is another guy who's just <coughs> hasn't looked well in the past two years since he, his run at the championship a couple of years ago. He's a Brazilian. He's good at grappling. He's good at, with his hands. He used to have that power. We use that as you see right there. Submission, decision, decision, split, split. So he's he's lately gone to a decision, but he was a finisher early in his career. And then he got held who submission. Then he got another submission. 
you got decision against Steger, Brandau, and you got decision, and then you got the decision loss. So these two guys are guys that are going to go to decision majority of the time. But Marcin Hell has that grappling background that I think did in Schultz last time. He was able to take him down a couple times. He was able to outstrike him a little bit, and that's why he was able to win. And he he just did it just enough to beat Schultz. And I think it's going to be the same thing around. I think Marcin Held's going to be a more aggressive guy. He's going to look to uh, take down uh, Schultz, and he's going to use those uh, power uh, hands to uh, do some damage to uh, Schultz. But Schultz's going to fight back. He's going to give him uh, hell, and. Uh, he's not going to quit or tap or, I think, get knocked out. And that's why I think it goes to decision. It could be another split decision, but I got Marcin held with the grapple in, in his corner, edging out short once again and getting him on the board with three points and then uh, leaving uh, Natan Schult with a zero uh, going into the playoffs. So, once again, I got Marcin held by decision or split decision. Moving on to the next fight on the PFL week four lineup. We got a light heavyweight matchup between uh, former UFC uh, veteran Amari Akhmadov going up against Theodorus Oxtuelis. This is going to be a fight where I think it's going to be very one-sided. <laughs> You got Wolverine, and then you got Theodores, uh, Russia against Lithuania. Uh, this is the theme of the day. We got a lot of uh, international fighters on, on this card, which is very nice. But Theodores has a, a MMA and judo background, so he's more so looking to strike and then get the fight to the ground with his judo style and then to just uh, use the submission game, as you see there. Submission, KO, but then he's lost by decision, submission, and then uh, decision. Whereas Amari Akhmadov is all about the knockout. He is heavy-handed. He throws at you. He's very aggressive early on. He comes at you. He, he throws 100% power, and then it's gonna, it's kind of he is gonna knock you out, or he's gonna knock you, get knocked out because. As he keeps going, he wastes so much energy with those shots that he starts to get tired. So in like the second or third round, that's when he starts to like really slow down. And then if he has a one, his opponent has a chance to take over and to get that shot. As you saw in the Jordan Young fight last year, Jordan Young was able to come on late strong and knock him out in the third round. But Amari was able to get the first round knockout in week one <coughs> and to showcase his power. And I think he's going to continue that against Theodorus. I think Theodorus has been prone to those types of shots. And I think early on, uh, Amari will showcase his good uh, takedown defense. I think he's going to do a scouting report. He's going to know to look for those judo throws and for those takedowns. And he's going to, do whatever he can to defend them early. Later on the fight, if the fight goes later in like the uh, second, third round, I think Theodorus would have more success with those takedowns that could lead to finishes on the mat. But I don't think it's going to get that far. I think he stuffs one or two takedowns in the first round. Amari comes at him, guns blazing, applies pressure to him, gets him to the cage, and then lands that knockout shot. So I got Amari Akhmadov winning by round one knockout, giving him six points once again, which would give him a total of 12 points, which would guarantee him a spot in the PFL playoffs. Moving on to the next fight on the card. Uh, we, we, we should be getting into the main card, and we are the first fight in the main card. Is a lightweight matchup between uh, former UFC veteran Jeremy Stevens going up against Miles Price. Uh, we got Little Heathen going up against Magic. We got United States going up against Ireland. And in both of their first fights, uh, Stevens lost by decision to Clay Cotter in the main event of week one. 
So that's a big thing to keep track of. But he, he, they used to went to town. He landed some good shots on Coward, but Coward's boxing was just impeccable that fight. He was a step ahead of Stevens. Steven had no quit in the fight. He kept on going at him. And I enjoyed the whole fight. And I think he's going to come back strong. And then you got Miles Price, who got a triangle choke submitted by Anthony Pettis. Uh, Miles Price is coming in from Belter. He was able to beat one of the top uh, uh, fighters in Belter, Peter Corley, by decision before joining PFL. He comes in here, and then it just um, he had the wrong place at the wrong time against a uh, resurgent uh, Anthony Pettis, who's looking to get back on track and make make that pl- uh, playoffs the second time around in his second year in uh, PFL. But you got uh, two guys that can throw down, and Miles Price can also grapple. He's fighting out of Ireland, of course, uh, but I got Jeremy Stevens winning this. I think he, I think he gets it done in rounds two or three by a knockout. Jeremy Stevens, if he was fighting anybody in week one, other than Cotter, he likely would have knocked him out. But Cotter has a chin on him, and then Stevens had a chin on him too, uh, taking all those shots from Clay Cotter. I think he comes in here motivated to get a finish. He comes in there. Uh, defends any takedowns that he needs to defend. He comes in. He controls the center of the octagon. He pushes the pace. He throws uh, that leg kick, and then he follows it up with the with the overhand shot. He's going to do that several times in the fight. I think he catches Miles Price. Miles Price gets done, he, he, and then he finishes him in the second round, and then he gets the, his uh, points on the board with five. So I got Jeremy Stevens by second round knockout in this fight, which we're giving five points, which could get him into the the playoffs depending on how the 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 standings go after this week. But with this, I got Jeremy Stevens by second round KO. Moving on to the next fight on the card, we got the defending champ Roush Manfio. Going up against Olivier Uban Mercier. This is going to be one of the top fights of the card because uh, we got the Roush Manfio Cavallo de Guerra versus the Canadian Gangster. These two guys are both coming off of our wins. You got one by split decision, and then you got one by KO overhand right. Uh, Everybody thought Rosh and Vio was going to come in here like he did last year and then get a decision all the way uh, through. He he was able to just do just enough to win uh, volume-wise against his opponents last year. Got some help from the judges in the playoffs, but he, he's the defending champion. But then he came in here, looked motivated to prove everybody wrong that he, he did deserve it, and then he knocked out his opponent in week one. And he's going to be tested against uh, Uben Mercier, who has s- several backgrounds in him. He has a, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu background. He has a grappling background. He has a Muay Thai background. This guy can go with you, as you see right there in his last three fights. Uh, he has a decision. He has decision and decision. And then he has the two losses, but decision and decision. Two top guys in the UFC, Gilbert Burns and Ahmad Saruki. And so, but then you got Manfio, decision, 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 decision. And then you got the overhand KO. And I think it's going to be a matter of who can get their game going and who pushes the pace. Can Manfio uh, move forward and get um, Uben Mercier to move back, throw those shots at him? and get that knockout blow, or can he just have him move backwards, grapple with him, take him to the mat, and then control the fight that way and eke out a decision? Or will Olivier Uban throw those leg kicks, uh, start to rack up a little bit of volume with those, push forward and get the fight to the mat, or just rack up the volume? Because he can do it either way. He can rack up the volume, or he can make this a low-volume fight where it's on the mat, and where he has success uh, in, in that game because he has the submission game and then he has the, the striking game. 
I'm going with the defending champ here to win by decision here. I think it's going to be a close matchup. I think Manfio takes the first with the striking. Olivier takes it second with the grappling along the cage. I think he gets Manfio down once in the second. And then he does a little bit of work on there. But I think Manfio is going to have a little bit more in the third. And he's going to eke out a decision victory due to his striking and his grappling later. He he does have a really good cardio with them. Mercier has good cardio, but Manfio has better cardio. And I think it's going to work out to the best. And he's going to get three points by decision victory, which is going to give him uh, a total of eight or nine points in the stands, which should be good to get him back into the playoffs like he was last year. But once again, in this one, I got Roush Manfio by decision victory over Olivier Uban Mercier. Moving on to the next fight. On the main card, we got the co-main event. We got a light heavyweight matchup between defending champion Antonio Carlos Jr. Uh, going up against Bruce Suto. Uh, we got Brazil versus Brazil. Uh, in their last fights, uh, Antonio was able to get the submission Dosh choke victory over De La Monte in the first minute. And then Bruce Suto lost by KO, TKO, knees and punches to Rob Wilkinson. In the second round, you got Cara de Zapato versus Solado de Cristo. We got a world class BJ uh, and submission artist in in uh, in uh, Antonio Carlos Jr. And then you got a striker and uh, BJJ artist in himself in Bruce Suto. I think the difference here is going to be the experience factor. Uh, Antonio Carlos Jr. has been in this several years. He won it last year. He's fought the who's who in all of MMA. He came in last year and put on a show and and won the title. And now he's looking to defend it. He got that first submission victory. I think he gets another first round submission victory. You saw what uh, Wilkinson did to Bruce Suto. Uh, where he finished him. This is a guy that's either going to finish his opponent or get finished. And I think he gets finished uh, uh, by guillotine. Uh, I think Antonio Carlos Jr. does it again. Bruce Suto is going to uh, charge uh, charge at him. He's going to throw those uh, bombs at him. And, and he's going to look to try and finish Antonio Carlos Jr. early. But Antonio Carlos Jr. is going to uh, know what's, what's up. He's going to avoid that, and then he's going to convert it into a guillotine choke, and he's going to make Bruce Suto uh, tap in the first round. I, I say mid-first round, he gets the tap. He's going to get another six points, and it's going to move him into the playoffs with 12 points total with a great chance of uh, being the number one seed uh, in the PFL playoffs. But I just think it's uh, Antonio Carlos Jr.'s to lose. Unless Bruce Suto can catch Carlos Jr. square in the face before he can get anything going, I got Antonio Carlos Jr. by submission win this one and rolling into the playoffs on hot streak. So let's move on to the main event of the evening. This is the headline fight for PFL Week 4. We got Clay Cotter going up against Alex Martinez. These are two guys uh, that made the playoffs last year. Uh, we have Alex Martinez fighting out of Paraguay. We got Clay Cotter fighting out of the United States. They both won in the last fight by, by decision and by decision. Uh, in this fight, you got the boxer in uh, Clay Cotter, Cassius Clay. Going up against the grappler and kickboxer uh, in Alex Martinez. Alex Martinez is going to come in there, throw those uh, wide range of leg kicks. He's going to fight from a distance. He can also grapple with you. He likes to get you along the cage, throw shots to the body, shots to the face. He's going to do all the dirty things that you can do to win fights, but it's that distance scheme that he is great at. Uh, uh, in there, as you see right there, when he fought uh, 
Luke Rachabop and won by split decision. It was taken down several times, but it was those late shots where he was able to fight from a distance that did damage. And he he goes all three rounds, and he looks to uh, get the fight his way. But against a guy like Clay Carter, I, I, I think it's going to be uh, hard to win uh, against him. Clay's a guy who is very quick, has fast hands, has all those uh, uh, movements from being a boxer. He likes to throw the uppercut, the overhand shots. He, he always predicates on the jab, and he can move his head. And that's what he showcased last year and then this year against uh, Jeremy Stevens. Stevens did catch him a couple of times with good shots, but Clay was able to just be a little bit faster than Stevens, get off a lot a lot more shots than him, and he was able to stun him a, a few times. Uh, but the only thing that hurts uh, Clay Cotter in this format is the fact that the lack of finishes. He always goes to decision in his fights because – I, I feel like he doesn't put enough power in because I feel like he doesn't want to waste his gas tank or take the chance to go for a knockout because he wants to make sure that he gets the win. And that might do him in because he could get a win by decision here, but he could be left out because he doesn't have enough points. So we, we could see him going in here and looking for the finish just to make sure he can solidify himself into the playoffs. Uh, I see him going in here, uh, controlling the center of the octagon, get that jab going, incorporating the uppercut and the overhand shots into it. Uh, he, he has uh, shown that he can throw a leg kick at times too. Uh, I think he's going to be the one who racks up the volume. As long as he doesn't get caught with any big shots, which he usually hasn't by Alex Martinez, I see Clay Carter win this easily uh, by decision. I won the win by knockout. I just don't see it happening with how the way he fights, the way he preserves his uh, cardio. So I got Clay Cotter win this by decision. He gets the three points and moves him to six points and puts him with a chance to go to the playoffs. But it all depends on how everybody else does. But with wins over Stevens and Martinez, if he ties with anybody, you would have to think that he would have a tiebreaker over them with the, the guys that he fought. But once again, in the main event, I got Clay Carter by a decision over Alex Martinez. That will wrap things up with uh, tonight's PFL Week 4 four card breakdown with you. Uh, before we wrap things up, I do want to show you guys the standings going into Week 4. Uh, I was going to show you guys that beforehand. Uh, but I'm going to show you now. As you see right there, you had Antonio Carlos Jr. with six, Amari Akhmadov with six, you got Wilkinson with five, Hendricks with five, you got Hamlet with three, and then everybody else uh, Teodoros, Sori, Suto, Pesta, Monte, and Silvera, all with zero. So there are chances for a couple of these guys to get in with Hendricks not competing this week. And so you got guys, if you can get a big time finish in the first or second round, any of those names with zero, they can shoot up all the way to uh, the uh, three or four uh, spot. If uh, uh, if Wilkinson doesn't win or and then with no Corey Hendricks fighting, even Hamley could get a decision and squeak in with six. So there's a lot of intriguing chances for guys to sneak into that playoffs with Carlos Jr. and Akhmadov at the time. I I think it's safe to say that even if they somehow miraculously lose, that Carlos Jr. and Akhmadov should be safe uh, go, uh, with uh, going into the playoffs, but they're still going to uh, get those victories that I think they do. I think they get those first-round victories. Then you got the lightweight, which is, even better, you got Pettis with six, Manfio. We had the third round knockout. You had Cotter and Martinez and Olivier Uban Mercier with three points. And then everybody else has zero. So, like I said before, uh, uh, any big time finish out of the bunch could shoot them all the way up to as far as second, third, or fourth. Uh, and that's why I made a big deal about Clay Cotter, who is fighting Alex Martinez. They both had three points. 
how he might look to go for a finish instead of preserving his energy because he could get a, a three points and get and move to six, but you could have two or three guys get first round finishes and then they would more than likely get a, a jump over him. Or you could have a situation where Olivier Uba Mercier shoots up over him and then somebody else gets a finish and maybe uh, Clay doesn't give his best effort and possibly loses. So there's chances for guys to still get in there, but I, I, I feel like there's going to be a lot of finishes on this card and a lot of chances for guys to uh, fight their way in. But those are the two standings for the fighters fighting on week four this week. This is the last chance to make an impact uh, before they go to the playoffs in August. Because as you see there, every fighter has two fights, and then the top four uh, points finishers make the playoffs, in which there's a, a couple rounds of playoffs uh, going where they're going to be in uh, New York, Wales, and London. So it's going to be an interesting uh, uh, couple months in the PFL uh, once we get uh, weeks four, five, and six uh, in the bag. But other than that, that'll wrap things up with the PFL week four, uh, four card breakdown. Uh, and once again, if you guys want to uh, support the podcast, uh, the cash app is... Uh, money sign Daniel Bakley. If you wish to support the show, I do really appreciate it. Like I said before, we put a lot of work into the podcast, so we opened up a cash app so you guys can support us and donate whatever you want uh, to it. Uh, we'd appreciate it a lot, uh, especially with everything uh, that we put into this with tape study and whatnot, developing the, the streams and whatnot. And then, of course, uh, uh, if you haven't done so already, please follow and subscribe to Cage My IQ on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, and YouTube. If you haven't done so already, hit, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below. And please uh, uh, ask for you guys to smash the like button down below and give me your thoughts and opinions on PFL Week 4 in the comment section to the right. But other than that, we will be back uh, next week for PFL Week 5 four-card breakdown for you. Uh, we're going to have another big week in PFL. Grad PFL is back. But other than that, I'm your host, uh, Cage. And this is Cage My IQ. Thanks for tuning in. But we will see you guys next week for another uh Cover for coverage of MMA uh, with UFC, Belter, and PFL. Thanks for tuning in.